Uh, and so now we're going to get into this conversation about when shots actually become films. And so let's kind of dive into that. So we're going to start this conversation, what is a good shot, and continue it with a Brisson quote. And then we're going to come back to this after we have a little bit of an, an aside. But a film rests entirely on the choice and construction. Success, if it comes, I love that he puts that, if it comes, comes because each thing is in its right place. So I get this note a lot, and honestly, it's particularly from DPs, and they will, the note often tends to be something along the lines of, is this the best shot? Is this the best shot? I mean, part of it is like, I guess not, if you're asking the question, A, B, no, I, I, I picked the worst shot and put it in there hoping you tell me it was the worst shot. The, the reality of the conversation and what they're actually pointing to is intention, and that should be what what we're noting, and those are the notes that I love to get as an editor, is like, what was your intention here? And is your intention to put this shot in line with my intention with what the film needs to be? That's the director and the editor collaboration. That's where the real magic happens when shots become films, I believe. And so the note should be, is this an intentional shot? And if it is an intentional shot, what is the intention? And then does that intention line up with my intention or my voice as a filmmaker? And so those are, those are the conversations that you want to look for with collaborators, kind of all through the process, whether it's production, pre-production, post-production, or even film and sales and distribution, all of that. Those are the conversations you want to have. What is the intention of the film? Where is the film going to go in and of itself, but then beyond itself? And so those conversations can be difficult to find with collaborators. There's one collaborator that I cut for quite often, his name's Ryan Booth, and we have those intention conversations a lot. And I've had the privilege to, to come alongside him in his directorial career, and I'm on a parallel path in my editorial career, and over time will intersect professionally and also um, personally, and we kind of build our careers together, and then over time you look back and there's a decade of learned experience and conversations and, and the vernacular that you share, that way when you land in an edit suite and you land on a project, you can kind of go quickly and you can build something meaningful and truthful together and so those are the collaborations and the conversations that you want to look for when you're looking for for collaborators and it may seem obvious but it's not obvious because a lot of times you can get rude into having collaborators that may be spinning in circles or may be stagnant or may just try and use you for your um, skill set or your ability with you know, directors cuts and, and, and things like this I do a lot of them but you know, you want to do director's cuts for the people that are going to respect you and respect your time, but also you know that the director cut is going to be significant for them, and it's going to be significant for you, and then you're going to grow and build together. And so the, the, there's an art and a craft of finding collaborators, but we can talk about that later. So back to the best shot. You know, is this the best shot? Are there even best shots? And I think the answer is definitively no. There are, there's no such thing as a good shot. There's no such thing as a good shot. There's no such thing as a bad shot. There's only appropriate shots. Appropriate for what? The truth that Tarkovsky speaks of, right? Something pointing beyond itself. It's the combination of these shots that point to something greater than the sum of the parts. So there are no good shots. There are no bad shots. There are merely appropriate shots. That's why, see, that's why a lot of times, so this is where it starts to filter down. So there's the abstract conversation. And this is where it starts to filter down into workflow. Because if you believe that there are no good shots and bad shots, if you believe that you want all of the options on the table, it starts to manifest itself in how you approach the shots when you import them into your analogy of choice. And so here are my select reels of sorts. Um, elevated, I'm watching down the footage and I elevate the shots that speak to me in the moment and speak to me and I feel something truthful happening in the frame, but I'm not gonna delete the bits between, right? I'm not gonna delete the, 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 the content between what I think is truthful in the moment on my first watch down, which is the privilege of the editor, the first audience, and then we take the first, what we've learned as the first audience and we translate it to the second audience, which is the true audience. And so we, I, I, I elevate the shots that hit me in a specific and a certain way when I'm watching down the footage the first time. But I'm not going to delete the stuff. And then I don't make selects rules. I don't remove everything and only keep my selects because out of sight, out of mind. And for me right now, when I'm making my selects on the first watch down, I don't even know what the film is yet. I don't, I don't even understand the, the texture, the tones, or the vibes, or like what the film wants to be. I haven't caught the film yet. And we'll talk a lot more about catching the film because that's, 
that's something that's really meaningful, and I think that's where you find your true collaborators, and you find people that also want to catch the film, and do the work of catching the film. Um, but this is the process that I go through with my selects. They can draw attention to myself as I'm later on, when I'm going back and I'm ready to assemble the film, I can be attentive to the things that struck me immediately on, on the first watch, but I also have a better understanding. I'm closer to the film. I'm closer to catching it, and then when you catch it, you kind of study it, and it tells you what it wants to be. And so I don't make selects reels, and I, and I don't do anything like that. And that's why there's a lot of these you know, YouTube tutorials that are like how to edit faster. And it's like, okay, that's fine, but it's like, why edit faster? They never talk about why you want to edit faster. I guess it's made so you can fill in the blank of the purpose of editing faster, but if you're, if you're getting more proficient at your craft, and this would also go for a DP on set, a director, a writer, anything, it's like, why do you want to be able to type faster? Why do you want to be able to set up the shot faster? All of these things. And for me, the why points back to the truth. I want to be proficient in my craft, and I want to be proficient with my technology so that I can identify and capture the truth of a film quickly. And once you capture the truth of the film quickly, and then you can run even faster. And if you have that collaborator that can come alongside you, you start to run fast together. And so Brassam closes this conversation quite perfectly. All this to say, uh, I'm not looking for beautiful shots. I'm looking for necessary shots, which is not the same thing. So we've, we've, we've started to identify and dispel the myth of the best shot. There are no good shots or bad shots, merely appropriate shots. Um, and we started to understand what constitutes shots becoming films. It's not necessarily or specifically or exclusively the combination of the best shots, right? They need to be pointing to something truth, truer than, than, than themselves. And so a lot of us are working out a film while we're not actively making a film. A lot of us are filling up the, the truth that, if you will, in the back of our head. Like we have these experiences and we, have, we see this film and it's fine to go and look at your own medium for inspiration or to fill up the truth, but you also have to kind of look at other things, right? You can go to the museum, you can read, you can do all of these other things that manifest and start to kind of boil and simmer in the back of your mind. That way when you have a project, you can bring everything you have to the project and your experiences and your taste and your aesthetic and all of the, the things that you've put into your mind between the projects and your input needs to be greater to at, at least equal, but greater to the output. If you're not inputting good, you're not going to output anything good. And so for me, there's all of these analogs with these other artistic and, and um, endeavors that, that really are meaningful when, when I get into the edit. And when I get into actually creating something from nothing, um, and one of those analogs for me is poetry. And, and, and poetry and editing, I believe, go hand in hand in, in many ways. Um, I mean, you can look at a poem, and poetry is finite groups of text that are instantly pointing to something that is greater than, than just the sum of the, the words. They're breaking all of the grammatical approaches with you know, punctuation and, and where is the line break versus the punctuation and what does a sentence feel like if you cut it? You know, what does a period feel like? What does a comma feel like? What's a semicolon feel like? What does a line break feel like as you're cutting? There's all these rhythmic and these metric things and then they're just drenched in tone and aesthetic and vibe and, and, and meaning. And so for me, I, I get a lot of information out of a poem um, that manifests and finds itself into the way that, that I cut, whether it's a film or a montage or a commercial sometimes. Um, and Brassan says poetry and truth, truth he's speaking to is a filmic truth. Poetry and truth are sisters. And so the combination of the poems and the truth, I mean, even Tarkovsky's father was a, was a really famous Russian poet. And he gleaned a lot of inspiration from all of his films, and a lot of them are based on the premise of his father's poetry. And so there's a lot of, a lot of analogies, and those analogies really become meaningful and impactful. Again, it's another abstracted conversation that finds its way into the tangibility of an NLE. And so we're going to read this poem, except you're going to need your phone because it's a QR code situation because I didn't want to put it on the screen. And so scan that, and let's read that silently, please. So this is a poem by Seamus Haney, super 
very, very well-known poet, and he has this in, in this incredible ability to instantly pull. I mean, how is the, I mean, how is that not a movie, right? At least the tone and the vibe and the aesthetic, right? The 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 desires of growing old, and then as you grow old, you realize that all of your dreams that you had as a child are nothing more than fermenting and rotting blackberries. I mean, it's 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 just so fraught with this coming of age, and then realizing that age might not be. A, there's a lot of under and so. He has this incredible way to pull you into the emotion and the tone, and he uses a lot of organic and natural textures to elicit that. And so I read this poem or any of his other poems, and, it, and it's what he's doing is going after a very specific, uh, you might say, emotional texture. He wants to take the, the reader, in this case, he wants to take the reader on a journey, on an experience, and provide them some kind of tangibility, some kind of poetic truth that they then have that experience. And so I will never have an experience like this with the tones and the aesthetics and the specificity that he's speaking to. I'll never have that experience, but I read it and I get a sense of the experience, right? And I get a sense of the emotion and I get a sense of the tone and then I put that in my tool bag and I go along my way and then in three, four, five, ten years I come upon a sequence or a scene or an act or a film that is also trying to attempt not the exact same emotion but something in that space and I can recount that poem, I can pull that, I've had that experience and now I can move that and pull that into my craft and into the actual act of, of making uh, a sequence or a scene. So. Poetry can point to, there's an, there's an analog in a, in a connection between editing and, and, and poetry from, from an emotional and tonal and aesthetic and vibe standpoint. But then there's also an aspect of poetry that's very metric driven and rhythmic driven. And, and you can look for different cues of, of, of what that means. So like, let's, what, let's read this one. This one will go quicker. So, I mean, like, you can, I mean, it's just like, what even is that, right? It's, I mean, it's like, there's so many, there's so much in that line break and in that, uh, the, the, the metric, and, and it has a heartbeat of its own. And you can, you know that the poet is trying to take you on more of, like, a, 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 um, a rhythmic journey ne than, than necessarily a specific emotional journey, although the emotion is there. And so it, it's the... It's the heartbeat that is felt within the film. That's that's what we're going for in our sequences. Is it not like you want it to feel? You want it to feel something. You want the heartbeat to be there. You know, I, I'm, I'm when I'm cutting. I mean, it's, if if it's a feature length project or something like that, like I could take weeks to try and find the identity of a film, and I put this shot by this shot, and like it doesn't really work, or I put this shot by that shot, and it's like yeah, it's okay, and then I'll put that shot by that shot, and it's like okay, well. It's, getting interesting and then we'll add some sound and then we'll add some music and all of a sudden the screen starts to vibrate. I always look for the moment where the screen starts to vibrate. We keep it like, that's the thing, like that's the film. Like I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is yet. Like I just barely can can make something out but but there's there's an aesthetic and a vibe here that is the film that I want to make. And so then you you start to chase that and that's where editing faster actually helps you, right? You start to chase the film because now all of a sudden the screen is vibrating and then you'll put another shot and that works and you put another shot and it doesn't work and you don't know why and so you take that and then another shot and and all of a sudden you're cutting faster and faster and it's like you're chasing this wispy character through the woods and you're trying to identify the film, you're trying to catch up to the film and then you're reaching out and finally over time as you're cutting more and more scenes and more and more sequences it feels like you're almost running parallel with the film and then you can get up close and start to study its features and that's the assembly phase for me. It was when I'm chasing down the films, I get the clay on the table and it's in the rough shape that I perceive the film to be now and then I get closer to the film and I can start to make out its specific textures and its features and in the way that it wants to be and I study the film more and then all of a sudden you can start to add in these tones and these vibes and like really bring to life the film and so it's the act of chasing the film is where you come and, and then over time you know the film starts to tell you what it wants to be and then you tell it what it should be and then the director has that conversation as well and we're all servants to the film at a certain point and we're just trying to keep this thing on its feet and we're trying to usher it across the finish line and then the really fun thing about film is that it continues long after you've delivered it long after distribution long after it's on screen you it still is telling you what it wants to be and it still is telling the audience what it wants to be and a film kind of takes on a life of its own i found this clip there's some audio on it so i found this clip of spielberg 
like in the with close encounters of the third kind after it already come out he's doing all of this press and then finally he realizes what close encounters of the third kind is actually about to him and he had no idea what it was until this moment i just i, I, I don't know i just really like this moment where a film tells you what it wants to be after you've delivered it your father was a computer scientist your mother was a musician when the spaceship lands how do they communicate that's they, a very good question i like that <laughs> you've answered the question they make music on their computers and they are able to speak to each other. And you see, I'd love to say, you know, I intended that and I realized that was my mother and father, but not until this moment. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so here we have shots. So our working definition, and we're going to start to wrap up, and I want to get to some questions if you if you have any. But but here we have shots. So our working definition is shots that you uh, sense something significant happening, truthful, going beyond the events on screen. Okay, and you feel the heartbeat, the metric rhythm of a film, and the screen is vibrating, uh, and then you have appropriate shots sequenced in appropriate ways. That's where we so far stand with this. When do shots actually become films? And so. What I want to get to now, though, because underneath all of those conversations, beneath all of that, um, those terms, I think is actually the foundational and fundamental truth of when shots actually become films and, and the, its intention, right? It's the intention of a filmmaker, you know? And I don't speak of intention necessarily as a director's from whom's head truth and honesty flow abundantly like the reality is and when, when I say intention what I mean is the intention to chase down the film together the intention to catch the film together that's true intention in filmmaking I believe is the willingness to enter into a filmmaking process and say I don't know what this is I have an idea of what this is I've seen the figure of what this is but now let's work together to create and those are the collaborators that I really seek after and those are the collaborators that I've cut for for years and so the intention to catch the film is the thing that I'm constantly looking for within a collaborator so the base of the conversations between shots and films is intention is determination is desire it's persistence um, I, there's, I, I kind of fill in between the lines here, but there's this Michelangelo quote that when someone is asking him about David and how he created David and the process of sculpting David, um, he, once he identified his intention for the sculptor, he just simply just removed everything away that was not David, and then there was David. And so, especially with documentary filmmaking, which is what I love, and the, the process of documentary filmmaking is a huge block of marble like just slammed on your desk, and then you just look for these shots that start to speak to what the film wants to be, and then once you identify the identity of the film, you simply remove everything away that is not the film, and at the end of the process, you're left with the film. And that has a lot of different manifestations with, um, with, with the director, and, and over time, as you start to put this thing together, someone will come up and say, how did you come up with this montage or how did you come up with this scene or how did you capture this moment in time and if the film is done properly or if the film is done at least with a respect for the process and, to, and, and, and if cameras tend to not be on the answer often is I don't know it like it just happened it, it like the, I don't know whose idea this was but in the process of collaboration between the director or the DP and the editor and the film itself this thing just kind of became and so the, the, the process of, of identifying what the film wants to be and then removing everything that the film is not in order to be left with what the film is. There's a lot of work, like a lot of work. I mean, you gotta watch everything so many times and there's so many different iterations and cuts and, uh, and, and it just takes an incredible amount of time and thought to get to the point of removing everything that is not the film. Because you have to understand it so intimately to know what is not true to itself. And that's where I say, I have this, I say this quite often, around the post house that I own and, and, and I run, and it, it, it's, it goes like this. 25% of being a great editor is being great at editing. Like everything else that you have, everything, the way that you build your life, the way that you fill up that vat of truth, the, the way that you dispel and you break down and you have conversations with collaborators about specific approaches to films, the way that you 
take those abstract conversations and filter it into your workflow to allow yourself to be to, to, to catch the film. All of that stuff is what makes somebody, and you can adapt that for anything, 25% of being a great director, as probably it was, 15% of being a great director is being great at directing, right? It's everything else that goes along with it. And so here we are. This is, this is like, there's a lot more that we could say, and there's a lot more that, that I would like to say, but we're going to stop here, and I'm going to take some questions. And, but before we do that, here's, a, here's our, working, our, our working thesis. When do shots become films? So shots become films when the shots point to truth via appropriate selection that carry tone, emotion, with a heartbeat through rhythm, metric, pacing, and all built on a foundation of intention. Relatively simple, I think. And so there's a really great Carl Dreyer quote. He says, um, he says, sometimes I wonder if my films are worth the investment. And he's talking about the emotional and personal uh, investment. And I think that's a, that's a fine place to, to end it. And so I think we have like a couple minutes, yep, to take some questions. And the questions don't necessarily have to be about anything that I talked about. They can be about anything. It can be about craft and Industry, whatever, whatever you got, I'm definitely down to answer the, answer any questions. Other than I can't see anything right now, and so, thank you. I'll say. Anybody got any questions about stuff? Yeah. Sounds like a music video director. That's a joke. I think working with directors uh, that have a very specific vision, I think, you know, I think a lot, of the, a lot of my approach to collaborating with directors is to, before the process is, has, has specifically begun, but it's obviously already begun because we're talking, is identify what it is that they're trying to achieve? Like what is their initial and original intention? Because throughout the process you can, um, you can drift from that quite, quite far, whether it's a film or a commercial. And, and so for me as an editor, it's identifying early on what is your initial and original intention? And then a lot of times I'm tasked with pr protecting that original intention of, of the director and, and in many cases reminding the director of, uh, of the initial intention. And it's completely fine to, veer away from that as a director and, and things often morph as they should through the different through writing through production through um, editing you, everything morphs but you want to at least be a reminder of the original intention that way if we start to go too far from that if we start to veer too far away from from that line of thinking or, or that approach and so i mean you, you read a lot of articles and in, in conversations in specifically talking to the editor and the director relationship and the director will often say they're also my therapist to uh, uh, an, a non um, joking manner of course they're not you know, but um, you have a lot of conversations about that uh, well your original intention was this is this still where we want to go or do we want to modify and, and and so if they have a specific vision I say come alongside that spe that specificity in the vision but also be willing to push and pull them in a direction, especially over time when, when their vision starts to change, make sure I would truth check that, right? I would check that and be like, is this where you want to take this, this scene or this moment because originally you had intended this? And I mean, that's open and honest conversation and sometimes that doesn't work. And then if that doesn't work, I tend to not work with that director for very long. And so it is, it is a, it can be a tricky and sensitive subject, especially when you're coming in as a collaborator for your vision and for your opinion and then at some point you know if it's not you, you just kind of shrug you just put your hands down and get the piece done and like move on and and land on another one and see if it's the same thing and so yeah I think that that's that's what I often do is just remind the director of their original intention if they have such a specific intention on the outset yeah
Yeah. Well, like, how does that work? Is it, I'm working with it right now in my own project, and it's a yeah. Really tricky relationship. Yeah, totally. Yeah, is this um, like an original content project, or is it like a commercial, or? Oh, okay, cool, yeah. I think the 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 relation. Hang on, I just gotta think about that for a minute. So the relationship between the screen and the speakers. So the voice is the speakers, right? And then the screen is also. And I'm 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 a very sound heavy editor, and it's not necessarily in that specific, but. Um, Brisson has another quote where he says, what you've given to the ears, don't give to the eyes, right? And so what the voice, the work of the voiceover, what the voiceover is doing, which it is going to be a little more specific based on the fact that it is words put together in sentences and it's speaking about something specific. And so the weight and the, the work that the speakers are doing in that instance with the voiceover, don't duplicate it onto the screen is what I would say. Like, they shouldn't be doing the same thing. They should be working not necessarily in juxtaposition to each other, but at least in collaboration with each other. And so I would identify like, okay, here's this sentence and this is, the, this is what this sentence is achieving by being present in the piece. What are the other things that I need this scene or this moment to achieve as, as itself? And can some of the weight that is being on the voiceover be put onto the screen? Like, or where does the screen need to come into play in order to, because you don't ever want it to feel like there's a series of images and then slapped on voiceover. You want it to feel like something is happening. And so I think the way that you feel like something is happening with images and voiceover is you prescribe a certain level of of work that the voiceover and the speakers are to do, and then you prescribe a certain level of work that the screen is meant to do. And then you, you play with that weave and that bob and you, and you identify throughout the piece, like all, all of a sudden maybe the screen is doing a little more work here, maybe the voiceover is doing more work here. And so that, that's what I would do, is just identify what, the, what job each should be, ought to be doing, and then build the scene around that, if that makes sense. What do I do when I feel stuck? Uh, in like editing? Yeah, like or life? In cool, cool. I was just gonna, I was gonna have to think longer on the. Uh, hmm. I, I I read a lot. Uh, I'll read. Um, I'll step away. You know, I can edit for a very long time, but I have I have. Uh, there's like an internal clock that all of a sudden it's like. Anything that I would do beyond this point would probably be undone tomorrow. And so a lot of times for me, if I feel like fundamentally stuck, um, I'll just walk away and just, you know, go for a walk or set it down for a while and you know, go do something else. And then, and then a lot of times your brain continues to work on those thoughts. You know, your best thoughts are when you're not, your best ideas are when you're not working on the thing. And so for me, I'll, I'll step away and like let it, let it marinate for a while. But then the other thing too is I'm um, I'm a very non-linear editor and so I'll start cutting something that's interesting to me. So let's say I have a feature and I've watched all the footage. Like I'll start cutting something that, um, I don't start at the beginning. I start whatever is in, interests me. And so if I get to a point in a, in a film or a piece where I feel stuck, then I say, okay, I feel stuck. But like what would inspire me or what would get me excited about something again? And if it's a scene that's like 20 minutes down the line or 20 seconds down the line or whatever, I'll jump and start working on that because I have some thoughts and some ideas that I can institute immediately. And then the other thing that I do that's really helpful for not getting stuck is like you can start to feel a wave that you ride uh, where you're like really knocking a bunch of stuff out and it feels really good and you're being really creative and, and you feel good and then you can start to feel yourself like it starts to wane just a little bit and then I stop. And I stop before I've run out of things to do and then I make a list of things that I'm going to start tomorrow and then that way tomorrow when I open it up, I start with this predefined list of things and it kind of jump starts me and gets me going in that, in that direction. And so, I mean, those are a couple of things I do when I'm stuck or to avoid getting into the position of being stuck. So, I don't know if that helps. You can try it though. Yeah. So, like, when you first start a project and you have that, like, a, like this big block of marble, right? Yeah. Um, and maybe it's because sometimes I'm editing my own projects, but it can be so overwhelming. Yeah. Um, like, it's, it's like, 
once I get going, it's great. But it's, it's actually kind of like emotionally taxing at first. Yeah. So it's like, how do you deal with that? I mean, yeah. I think part of it was in the question, you said like once you get going you feel great, so part of it is to just get going. Um, but that can be a lot of work to identify where you want to get going. And so once you have the block of marble on, on the table, and it's, it is difficult to identify like where are you going to insert that first chisel to, to start to carve away what everything that the film is not. For me, I just start like playing around. And I don't put a lot of pressure on that first pass or that first cut of anything. I think that's where a lot of, I think that's where a lot of, uh, you know, writer's block, if you will, is they're kind of tied in the same thing. But th that's where a lot of one's inhibition to actually start a project comes in is because you're putting too much pressure on yourself at the beginning. Like for me, I just start playing around with scenes. And I afford myself the time to play around with scenes to, like we talked about, to start to chase the film, to put these pieces together, to wait for the screen to vibrate, to wait for the film to become manifest and like make itself known to you. And so for me, I just start playing around. Now I'll identify some things that get me really excited. Like I'm, I'm really interested to see what I can do with this, with this scene and this sequence. And so then I'll start there. And, and I don't put too much pressure on that because everything I cut gets recut. Like everything I cut gets recut at some point throughout the process and so you might as well not be so precious now um but i think part of it you know is you just have to get going but identify something that gets you excited to get going is what i do does that make sense yeah. cool any other questions all right well thank you thanks for coming by thanks for hanging out and uh I got one. You got one. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you, you're pretty methodical about how you edit. Um, where, when did you see that switch in your like, workflow and like, how did it start feeling fast? When did I see, feel myself becoming methodical? Yeah. Hmm. Or is it just because you're making a movie based on stuff? Not a ton. No. Do you find yourself referencing those like, quotes? Like, I mean, you read a lot, but. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Let me let, let me think about that for a minute. So I, I think a lot of you know, like we stand on the shoulders of giants, like legit giants in the film. Uh, it's a young medium in the grand scheme of things, but there's some really great thinkers and long ago thinkers and so I think it's foolish to not uh, to not look back on their thoughts and you I mean you go back and you look at the things that they're writing about and it's just like it's so apropos to the craft and to the approach today right and so I think for me um, I do have to build some I have to build some philosophical methodology but also some practical methodology because if I don't I won't get paid uh, because I have to get things out on a specific timeline. And that's where the rubber meets the road is when timelines are involved. And so for me, it is very methodical in my approach. And it's one of the reasons I love being an editor, right? I like wake up at 5.45 and then I take 10 steps and I go to the coffee machine and I make the exact same cup of coffee. I take 15 steps over here. I read my book, I eat my bagel, right? Like I'm very methodical in my approach because I need to, in some sense, uh, you know, almost build my life around this craft and like this thing that I wanna do. And so the reason that I become so methodical is to allow creativity to, to happen right now because I don't have the luxury as an editor or commercial editor or a paid editor, I don't have the luxury to wait for creativity. However, I'm paid for creativity. So those two things don't go well together, you know, because you don't, you, you, like, it's, you can't wait for your muse to come around when it damn well pleases and then you're getting paid to make sure that you have it on a leash that you can uh, call on it in a moment's notice. and. And so you have to kind of build your, your, your toolkit and your life and your approach, I think, in a lot of ways and um, around being able to access creativity immediately. And so I am very methodical and I do read a lot of these quotes and I do read a lot of their books and reread books and I have monthly rereads and yearly rereads and I need to keep this stuff fresh and I'm constantly looking. There's the, this... Uh, they're, they're, and they're, right now they're translating all of these old cinema, uh, there was this like cinema magazine 
this Italian cinema magazine and French as well. And like, they're just not from the way long, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and they're just now translating. It's like awesome stuff. But so I'm constantly looking for new things to read to kind of build my life around that to allow me to be creative when I need to be creative because I don't have time to wait for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. We have like one more maybe. And that's it. But that's okay. All right, cool. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it.